basically, I thought, what can I do? Something with a British angle, um, and uh, and wanted to cover something that the UK has been well known for recently, and that's the release of um, military files and national archive files. Um, and the U the UK has got quite a reputation for this at the moment. Um, for the fact that it's got this staged release, a very slow release of hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of pages of data, of sightings that both military and civilian personnel have put through. Um, so all I'm going to do, um, I've got to try to give this what I call an exopolitical perspective. So it's looking at the whole idea of Freedom of Information Act and military file release um, from a slightly different angle and weighing up is it useful for us? Is it a, di is it a diversion from what we should be looking at? Um, what, what angle are the government and the military and these other agencies uh, coming from when they, uh, when they release these files? Um, what sort of view are we getting of the whole UFO and the wider exopolitical phenomena by um, having these files released to the, uh, to the wider public? So, uh, there's a lot of contradictions going on with the file release, as I'm going, to, um, I'm going to say, I've got some video in here, but I'm going to skip all that because we're pushed for time. I think we've had to reduce everything by about an hour, so I'm going to just skip through with, with um, images. Um, as you'll see, the, the contradictions that come through with file release, as in the whole idea that this is to do with um, freeing of information, making people more aware of an issue, and yet I think as we'll see from some of the historical things that go right back to the Second World War, um, that's not always the case. So I quite like that quote, I don't know where it came from, but I quite like that quote at the top. Um, the truth is so precious that she should always be, atten be attended by a bodyguard of lies. And I think as we go on, you should see that that's, that's the case. So although I think we've had, um, I think we've had about five or six national countries actually backing the file release, um, that's actually formal governments. When you include military file release and smaller organisations within governments, there's many more. I think it's about 12 or 13. But actually official governments, I think there's about five or six that have, have done it. That's the last time that I, I checked. Um, but the British have certainly made a big issue over this. Um, we're one of the few places, of course, that had the UFO desk headed by um, uh, Nick Pope, of course, that many of you are aware of. So Nick managed the UFO desk in the 1990s, and that's part of the branch of the MOD that dealt with these files as they came in. Nick dealt with um, military sightings and also civilian. Say again. Okay, keep it away. All right, yeah, okay. Um, so, so yeah, so Nick was part of that, um, and basically what's happened is the National Archives were given the, were given the job of dealing with these, this vast amount of files that have collected over the years in, in various military, mostly the MOD, but in various uh, military divisions, um, and so there's been this stage release of these files. The, the main reason, um, you know, you could say it was to do with enlightening the public, actually it was to do with the fact that, um, as we all know, the the UFO issue has grown huge. In fact, um, in Britain and Europe, then the demand for um, the reporting of sightings has increased. I think I think it's doubled since uh, in 2008, 2009. Um, finding that in many of the European countries, um, the media are treating the whole issue a little bit differently. So the MOD were finding themselves totally overworked with the amount of files that they had to deal with. So that was their reason. They thought they'd do this release and it would save them time with the amount of, um, the amount of inquiries that they'd have to deal with. Um, and as we've seen, the, one of the interesting things that demonstrated this demand was when the French also released their files, um, they had a huge server crash. The, the files that they tried to give out for two days, their, their, their server, which were dealing with the file, file issues, actually crashed. Um, I wanted to make the point that to, to a lot of people, a lot of things to do with the, the file release are to do with very basic sightings. This is sort of an average form that you'll find when you look through these documents, if you've got the patients from all around the world, these countries that have released them, then most of them are to do with this. It's basically, look, I, I, I call it a distant light in the sky, and it's a description of those. So you've got a flood, and it literally is, if you look through the ratio, 99% are like this. Um, however, within, this, within the file release, 
the way that they've staged it, certainly the way the UK have done it, is they staged a certain amount of files, but they've got some highlights in, um, and certain cases, there are actually quite a few gems in there, um, if you have to look carefully, but you need the patience to look through um, that Paula also recently has found files from New Zealand and uh, where was the other and Ireland and they're both the same. They've got a lot, a huge amount of this sort of stuff, but the odd, the odd really good, interesting case in it as well. Um, this was just a bit of joint research. You can't see this. If you want to go to this is the UK Exportic site. Um, myself, this was in 2009. Robert and I think Ollie and also um, the guy who does Exopolitics Poland went through one of the releases and we all did a section on um, what we found in the, in the releases. So that's quite a detailed report there. It covers several pages. So if you're interested in one of our takes on, on this whole, you can go to the UK site and, and actually find that one. Okay, this is where it gets interesting. What, if you've seen the actual initial flyer for this event, I was actually gonna do the whole thing on Churchill. Um, what, what seems to have happened is Churchill co has come to represent a lot of the um, intrigue over file release and a lot of the contradictions over file release. Um, so basically I'll crack on with, with, with what, what happened with Churchill when the, this is what we found out by going backwards and looking into uh, in some of the files that have been released. Um, a lot from the actual war period, the actual World War II period, seem to have magically disappeared, but they seem to be referenced in, in other ways, which I'll, I'll, come to, I'll come to later. So this is basically one, um, this is one of the main ones that, that, that came about quite recently. Um, this is, of course, you're, you're all aware of the Foo Fighters um, to do with, this is an RAF bomber plane that encountered a silver disc. It wasn't even a Foo Fighter, the small lights, this was actual full-on silver disc that encountered coming back um, over the chat, the English Channel, um, and there was great detail given by the pilots that were flying in this plane, um, and obviously the, the report they gave um, was passed to the military and eventually got back to Winston Churchill himself, um, and obviously startled him to such a degree that he gave this quote at the bottom, um, you know, which is quite a, you know, it's, it's quite something to admit, especially for someone like him who's meant to be this brave, you know, this is our, this is our hero for, uh, for the Second World War. Um, this event should be immediately classified since it would create mass panic amongst the general population and destroy one's belief in the church. So that's an interesting point on his whole idea then of that perhaps religion was at the centre of that. Um, as Paolo said, it's also to do with um, economics and there's several other reasons as well why people think this should be kept quiet. So, so there you have it, a, uh, one, one, of, uh, one of Churchill's actual strong points in saying that. He actually put... This was discussed with Eisenhower and this, he demanded a 50-year blackout on this actual file and basically insinuating on the whole topic, the whole subject itself. So here's the first of the contradictions and this is one of the memos that I find a little bit strange. Um, so in 1952, which if many of you know about the USA, this was the year that they had the, uh, the huge amounts of sightings. There was also a huge amount of pilots that were, um, went missing as they went apparently up to chase UFOs. Very interesting year in the USA. Um, and so you had discussions there between Churchill and, and Eisenhower. Um, when Churchill saw the reports from the US press that made their way over to Britain, he ended up sending it out, out a memo to his senior staff and basically said, um, I summarise there, um, what's all this stuff about flying saucers? And asked for a reply in, at their convenience. Um, they didn't write back, it's just swamp gas, but they may as well have done, because when they, when they responded, they basically said, uh, don't worry, sir, nothing, nothing to see here. We've looked into this issue and there's absolutely nothing going on. This, this can all be attributed to Venus and misidentified birds in the sky. Um, so, but I find all that a little bit strange given that we know that Winston Churchill had um, a sighting or was aware of an incident in World War I. Um, you can go and look into that um, for yourself. He was an admiral at that time and there were certain things going on and you can find out about his, uh, the incident that he was um, aware of regards this issue. Of course, if, if this date is 1952, um, there was also the numerous, as we've just seen, the World War II issues. Close relations, of course, between the, U the UK and the US, especially with Eisenhower over the, the war, with, also with Stalin and stuff. 
Um, and other European leaders were aware of this issue. Mostly, I suppose, you've got the fascist leaders um, of Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, apparently very much aware of the, uh, of the issues of flying saucers. Um, so you've got to ask yourself, in that case, given this, this section here, why on earth would he be writing um, a memo with just the line saying, well, what's, what's all this stuff about flying saucers? And one idea that this was just um, put into the paper chain that Churchill was aware that these things would perhaps be passed around um, and would come out later, and this was his way of quietening, uh, quietening the whole issue down. Um, in addition, what was going on at the time, just as a bit of context for this, um, uh, Britain created, under Churchill for the 50s, the Flying Saucer Working Party. Um, this is basically a group of high-ranking uh, politicians and military men who um, basically did, just as uh, Blue Book did in the States, basically made people um, come to the decision that actually there's nothing much going on and the whole issue, um, as we'll hear, is this line that's often quoted that Nick, Nick that Nick Pope mentions of um, the UFO issue having no defence significance. Um, so um, the, the other point as well that's happened is we, we, we know from looking through these files and from um, relating them to experiences that are given outside of the fire, in other words, when we've interviewed old military people that have discussed this sort of thing from the 40s and 50s, that um, certain really interesting episodes actually haven't made it through the file release process. Um, and from, there's an, there's a, there are certain areas of the military, uh, one's called DE55, which, um, which we think the, the really juicy files to do with perhaps contact and to do with um, really interesting sightings, the ones that are a bit too hot, actually get moved into, uh, into, the, into this high-ranking military area so they don't actually make it down to the lower levels of um, politics, um, to lower levels of the military, and hence they don't even get considered for part of a file release process. Um, also, um, we were aware at the same time that structures were in place to deal with, with certain incidents. Um, so um, prior to all this, although we see Winston Churchill asking in 1952, what's all this about, um, about flying saucers, um, there are certain issues, there are structures in place to deal with the fact, way go, as we'll see in a minute, way back to the 40s, um, to, to deal with the fact that should, in this case we mentioned pilots, if pilots had an encounter in the late 40s and 50s, there was a strict process by which they were um, debriefed, told to say nothing, basically threatened. Um, and so you, you've got this bizarre contradiction. You've got Winston Churchill saying, well, you know, I need to know more about this, this thing about flying saucers, and yet these structures are in place to actually deal with that at, at a certain level. So again, it's this, the point I'm trying to make here is, what sort of light does that throw on this whole idea of the trustworthiness of um, file release and the way the British MOD have released these things? Uh, this is... Uh, one of the prime examples of that. Um, in 1957, uh, this is a US pilot called Milton Torres who was uh, based in the, in the UK. Um, and again, another contradiction that he was actually ordered to, um, a, a huge UFO came up on radar. He had a state-of-the-art plane that basically he was asked to go chase this UFO, engage a lock-on with, with missiles. He had 24 state-of-the-art missiles on board and to basically attack and fire his rockets at this, um, at this UFO. Um, he, I think he caught up with it, but the end, in the end, he, the UFO accelerated away. He didn't have a chance to um, fire his, his missiles at this rocket. However, um, and this guy is quite interesting, actually burst into tears uh, on several occasions because Interestingly, until the file release came out in the UK stating his case and giving an idea about what actually happened with his, because obviously he did a report and his, his seniors did a report, um, he had kept totally quiet, he hadn't been able to tell his son about it, he hadn't been able to tell his dad about it, and this had really cut him up inside, and uh, so when he actually saw, the, uh, he heard that the file release was out, um, this sort of freed him up a bit to go and be able to talk to... Uh, to talk about this issue. And, and again, you know, a, a real example there, a human example of what secrecy can do, the fact that people are told to, to keep quiet and, and faithfully he, he did this. But again, relating it back to the whole point um, that by the mid-50s, there's, there's a whole, although the, the MOD is saying that these things are of no defense significance, we've got um, a protocol in place that immediately, the moment this thing is sighted on radar, they launch state-of-the-art planes to go after, um, to go after the UFO. 
this is really interesting, and I wish I wish I had time to show you a clip of the uh, the video here of this. Um, but this is one of the earliest ones I could find. So this 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 man here, um, Mr. Hall, um, is based in Gateshead, which is in the north east of England, up in what they call Geordie Geordie Land, and. Um, Basically, when he was a sort of seven-year-old, he encountered um, a classic grey and a saucer along with other kids on the street right at the start of the war. Um, he then later met this, met this grey a day later and um, his uncle came up and hit, hit supposedly, hit this, hit this alien with a spade and they went and took this body and hid it, um, hid it in the church. Um, absolutely, when you, when you hear him, there's also other witnesses that come on the tape and, and back up his story. You know, seven-year-old children um, don't, don't mistake these sort of things. Um, he seems really sincere. A lot of his family back up what he said. Um, what is interesting is that even in 1940, um, despite the impression that we're given by these memos that, um, well, we don't really know what these UFOs are, we're, we're all in the dark, and even at 1940, all that time back, within hours of this, there was um, police, military personnel, scientists, there was complete media blackout um, in, along the whole of the, locally and the whole of the UK um, on this issue. Um, so again, you've got, you've got a contradiction, you've got a complete structure in place there to deal with this issue and yet the fire release, the fire releases are saying otherwise. So that's just to summing up the point of what I'm saying that you've got this basic sort of dichotomy, this split between the two. Um, Church, Churchill, the Churchill memo there saying that, um, that, these, that these, we don't know what these things are and he, this, this head of the you know, Prime Minister, head of strategist of the whole of the, uh, the military in the UK um, wants to know what they're about. The Flying Saucer, work, uh, Flying Saucer Working Party also created basically saying there's no defence significance in these things. But we have, like we've mentioned in 1940, we have a system set up to deal with this, pilots being de debriefed and even actively targeting, as we've just seen with the Milton Torres case, um, UFOs over the UK. So basically I think with all the hype that we've seen over, over the fire release process, um, I just want to get it a bit more in context because everyone's sort of there's a lot of people have been hanging on the whole process of well are we going to see some great revelation from these things and um, I think I just wanted to make the point that um, in a way there's, there's, there, there might be some angles within the far release that you could find some some gems and some li perhaps little avenues through to look through the you know to find a glimmer through the whole issue of the secrecy um, however there's there's we think, you know, really this, this thing operates on, the, on, the lev on, on many levels. One, one, of course, includes the whole idea of flooding, fire release flooding many, um, the majority of the sightings with um, the more mundane, the more basic ones of lights in the sky um, with, um, you know, you get the odd, the odd gem thrown in. Um, and so I put at the bottom here that, that's more, the more likely, instead of this being a basically full-on disinformation campaign, which I don't, I don't actually believe, I think there's, use, there's a usefulness in this government fire release process, um, that it's more likely that the real materials used, which is the classic method of sort of handling information and disinformation in a way, real material is used and filtered to remove the data points that would allow us to, to lead to a comp comprehensive hypothesis that certain sections of the government were aware of the ET and UFO issue. In other words, by putting out this, these numerous files in a fairly disorganised manner, complete with swamping us with lots of stories about fairly mundane matters, that we're unable to actually put a pattern together uh, and find out what the really crucial issues, which is what exopolitics is dealing with, you know, the, the crucial issues to do with contact, to do with disclosure. Um, and so I think it's down to us to weigh up how important these issues are, um, how important the issue of file release are, and, and to be very careful about the data that we're handed. So I, do, I just made another couple of points here that um, What's interesting is um, if you look at the, uh, there's a lot of talk about how the, you know, what Stephen Bassett, one of the people that does a lot for the exopolitics community, um, seems terminally disappointed that the USA haven't come forward and released any of their files, um, seem pretty, apart from a few um, Freedom of Information Act, uh, not a lot has been done. Certainly not, they're not refusing to follow the pattern of most of the European countries and some of the Latin American countries in doing a full on um, file release. However, um, I find it quite strange that compared to the British who very much fanfared and hyped their release of these files, um, when you actually look at the ones that have been made, these were made 
the Twiny member, I think, and some of the FBI ones, if you have a look, were made under the Carter, while Carter was in power. Carter was very good at releasing a lot of files in the USA. Um, so you've got things like the, the, the General Twining Memo that basically um, stated that these crafts are visionary, not fictitious. Um, some of the FBI files came to light recently. Um, if you have a look online, Bruce Maccabee looked into a couple of these. And so bizarrely, although the USA have not released, um, ha haven't done a formal file release as such, and are looked at by, as if this, they're part of this government that are still clamping down through the fact that the USA has a very efficient, in some ways, Freedom of Information Act. We've got several really good um, memos and bits of data that have come out from that. An example here of the British still holding back again, despite having this reputation of being, you know, that we've done this great, great service to, uh, great service to Britain and to the world by doing this very organised file release. Um, interestingly, again, with regard to the Rendlesham case, which many of you will probably be aware of, a huge, huge case. Um, it was only Larry Warren, one of the members of, um, who was actually present at the Rendlesham base, it was only when he did a, Freedom, a US Freedom of Information Act request that he got some of the data out from the USA that then started to trigger the interest in the whole, in the whole issue. Um, right up to that point, and onwards actually past that point since he got the data, the UK MOD consistently denied, including in Parliament I think when Lord Hill Norton brought it up, denied that this event ever took place. Then magically, the, um, the Holt memo, which had already come out in a, a, another form anyway, arrives formally in the archives. Um, so I'm just making a point there that again, the, the UK government are ob obscuring data and have obscured data. And, and again, as part, of, as part of this process, they're still in control of the information flow. Um, so a final point, because I think, I think I'm out of time nearly. Um, the, um, I made the point there, yeah, that the UFO, UK UFO desk, um, uh, as I mentioned before, that's <coughs> run by Nick, uh, Nick Pope, um, was closed down in 2009. This, again, is very strange and somewhat contradictory when you look at the facts that um, the, the government seemed very pleased with themselves as regards the whole fire release process, the, uh, the fact that they've done this, this, this stage release, very organised, very meticulous, has got a lot of press attention globally, and yet, um, to, as, this, as this process is just taking off, um, then they, they closed down the MOD desk. Um, what's, what's interesting is at the time they claimed, this was in uh, many of the broadsheet papers, that the reason for this was, was for the Af they needed Afghan war funding. Um, I actually worked out that the, they gave the budget for the UFO desk, or I went and found that somewhere. And I worked out that this actually would have allowed us, as in the Britain, to operate for a grand total of 13 minutes in Afghanistan. So they decided to shut down um, a very valuable UFO desk information service, so they say, for 13 minutes worth of fighting in Afghanistan, which seems a very strange, uh, very strange move to me. Um, so I said the, the actual, the whole, perhaps the other reason that the UFO desk got closed down is maybe more likely down to um, the fact that, that the subject area was increasing in interest vastly. We had a consistent from 2007 doubling in reported sightings. We had the media, both tabloid media and broadsheet quality media in, in Britain, actually treating this issue with a fair bit of respect. And you know, the references to little green men had, had basically be, begun to fade away. Um, I think there was problems that, that basically they saw how this area was taking off, how the file release was actually in some ways making the whole issue more, more popular. Um, and as I put down here, um, it, there was a danger of, the, an, of an official body legitimising the whole um, ET issue. Um, so the UFO desk had to go, um, so there was no actual legi legitimising of, of this issue and, and danger of it becoming even wider. Um, okay, we, we also did a section on um, Freedom of Information Act and contact. Um, the, the whole issue of um, contact, ET contact, is I think one of my favourites to do with the, uh, the whole wider area of exopolitics, um, but not had time to do that. Uh, Natasha was going to talk about a few of those points as well. So um, just wanted to leave you and draw your attention to the exopolitics journal, um, which I've contributed several essays to and coming out in a week's time. Um, if you're interested in the whole area of um, alien communication um, to do with academia, how, they, how they're looking at the, the issue, and there's a, another title there from one that has done, um, the journal's free to download um, at that link there, if you can see it in blue, exopoliticsjournal.com. You can also go and get back issues free. Um, there's, uh, there's several years worth of back issues there as well. Um, so 
Contact issues are in the UK files. There's several strange cases, um, but really, if you want the more interesting ones, then obviously it's go and read, go and read a book by John Mack um, instead, or take a look at these. Um, so that's just a quick glimpse into um, the pros and cons of UK Freedom Information Act, and uh, that's me done, I think. <laughs>